No one quite knew where the eye came from or when it opened. An eye that stretched from beyond the horizon and encompassed the entire sky had opened only moments ago. Its eyelid was time and space itself and its owner. Well, there wasn't one. The light pollution and smog of any one city did little to shield the respective citizens from the eye. No matter where anyone was at on the western part of the planet, Mexico, Brazil, Alaska, they all saw the eye, and the eye saw all of them. New York City, for once in its lifetime, stopped with the hustle and bustle and stared back at the eye staring at them. The vehicles traversing the highways which snaked through Los Angeles came to a slow halt. The people of Chicago stood in awe. Farmers in Iowa and truck drivers in Colorado and teachers in Florida and families in Washington and anyone else driving along the highway crossing from one end of the country to the other pulled aside and stared at the curious eye. Anyone who could see the eye, which was everyone beneath its gaze, stared in stupid wonder as its focus shifted from the ocean to a city and then to farmlands. And then, at once, the pupil dilated. The eyelid was the open night sprinkled with stars, galaxies, and the moon. Once the eyelid shut, the eye was no more. It vanished into nothing. Those who had gawked at the watchful eye wondered if what they saw was real. Charles Thomas, father of three and widowed, stood at the edge of his deck. His home was tidy and just what he needed after the car accident, a tragic event which took his wife from him and two daughters. It's been 25 years and he still remembers it all of it, everything. The memories haven't faded, but alcohol has dulled the edge of his pain. He shook off the nightmare and stood, waiting for the eye to return. His phone rang and he answered it. A soft feminine voice came through on the other side. It was his daughter, Lauren, and her tone carried an air of uncertainty and fear. She said, Dad, we were just lying on the beach in the Bahamas and we saw a massive eye that blocked out the sun. It took up the entire horizon. Then we were in the darkness. It, it was like it was night. It was there for about five seconds and then it disappeared. Dad. Charles walked inside. Two helicopters flew overhead and shook his home. As a picture frame he stood at shook, he said, yeah, I, I wish I didn't live near an army base. There are already two choppers up in the air and they're probably going to scramble a few more fighters. I'm, I'm heading inside. He walked through his kitchen and into his living room. Sitting above his fireplace were pictures of his late wife and two children. His youngest daughter, Lauren, was now 34. His middle child, Sarah, would have turned 38 this year, and his oldest, Bethany, would have been 40. His wife, Belle, she'd be 62. A drunken fool ran a red light and T-boned the right side of Charles's car. Unfortunately, internal bleeding resulted in the death of Sarah, and blunt impact killed Bethany and Belle as they were on the side of the wayward vehicle. The drunk guard wasn't wearing a seatbelt and became crimson paste against his windshield. One can suppose that him not wearing his seatbelt was a good thing because now he will never be able to drink and drive again. Charles shook the flashback out of his head and studied Belle's face, her eyes, her smile. This photo, consisting of himself, his wife, and three daughters once gave him peace now, it serves as a reminder that half of those people, his wife and two daughters, are bones in the earth and dead as stone. Lauren cleared her throat and brought her father's attention back to the conversation they were in. Charles looked into the loving eyes of his wife and whispered, Lauren, try and fly back as soon as you can. 
I have a bad feeling about all of this. Lauren said, We're already packing our bags, and David is already on the phone trying to buy two plane tickets so that way we can go back home, and Dad, it sucks that we have to cut our honeymoon short, but I, 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 think, I think that's what we have to do right now. Charles' phone buzzed in his hand. His poker buddy was calling. Charles wished his daughter good luck and sat down at the kitchen table. His house rumbled as three jets flew overhead. He took the call and his buddy indicated he saw the eye. Of course he saw it. Half the world saw it. His phone vibrated again. Another poker buddy was calling and then another. As he sat at the table, the screech of tires against asphalt reverberated through his home. Charles poured himself a shot of whiskey and sucked down the burning liquid. He clenched his jaw and then took another shot as he looked out his living room window. Four military APCs drove down the street, followed by seven Humvees. They pulled off the road and drove into the vast expanse of desert, leaving behind a shallow plume of dust. Charles nodded and took another shot of whiskey. Once the edge of the situation had dulled and the whiskey made him just a little less worried, he turned on the television and changed the channel to Station 4 News. The old tube illuminated to life and two news anchors from Channel 4 News, Paradise, Nevada, were reporting on the enormous eye. Alexis, a thin woman with auburn hair tied into a tight bun, clasped her hands together as she said with a taut smile, well, someone's ex or mother-in-law is keeping an eye on someone, and a big eye at that. Her co-anchor, Jason, a businessman type fellow, shook his head as he replied, Alexis, this just in. You're terrible with these jokes. Tonight, at around 6.42 p.m., a large eye was seen over the western hemisphere of the planet. People as far south as Chile saw it, as did people as far north as Alaska, although the people in Alaska only saw about a third of the eye. Alexis pressed her lips together and smirked as she said, You know what? It's probably the Russians. They do everything these days. It's all a hoax. All of it. Jason sighed and buried his face into his palm as he said, Government officials have released a statement and indicated they do not know the origins of the eye, or if it will return. The government believes that this may be an elaborate prank utilizing holographic technology. Alexis said, Now who has the terrible jokes? A hoax? Really? Really? A hoax? Come on. Remember that bum outside the station, you know, Sloppy Joe? Well, he was saying that Nazardin was coming. This spooky cosmic god is going to eat the planet like a smoothie. A smoothie, people. Do you think this has anything to do with those people washing up in the desert? Didn't they find an animal that just didn't look like it was from this planet? Look, everybody, it's a false flag. It's fake news. Fake, I tells you. Jason rubbed his face and requested a break. Rather than breaking to a commercial, the news cut to a reporter standing next to a dumpster, and beside him was a raggedy old man with a beard and a lazy eye. For whatever reason, his top teeth were gone, and he didn't seem to mind. His name is Sloppy Joe, and he is the town drunkard. The news anchor held a microphone to Sloppy Joe and asked for his opinion on the matter. Sloppy Joe said, Man, I found the best shrooms last night, and so it seemed natural to me to be behind McDonald's dumpster on Rainbow and Woodbury tripping balls, and something was whispering to me. It said it was a god, but I said, I just think you're my conscience. The more shrooms I ate, the more I began to understand the universe, and then it hit me. I saw an eye in my mind's eye. Its name is Nazredin, and it's going to slurp up this planet like a 7-Eleven Slurpee. The reporter said, Is there anything else that told you? Sloppy Joe wiped his nose on his shirt and said, Well, now that I think about it, 
It either said its name's Nazardin or that it's nuts rich, and I don't know. It also said, hey, whatever that means. The reporter asked, Are you playing a part in this elaborate hoax? You mentioned it said it was a god. What kind of god? Sloppy Joe threw his hands into the air as he said, A hungry god, duh. We're all about to die. I gotta go get me some more shrooms because there ain't no getting out of this pickle. Sloppy Joe walked out of view to never be seen again. Charles smiled for a moment. As he stood up, he said, Someone should give that man a radio show. Paradise, Nevada's own Sloppy Joe. His phone buzzed in his pocket and he removed it. A text had been received from Lauren and it read, Our flight leaves in an hour. The only direct flight I could get is a flight to Las Vegas. I know it's a three hour drive from there to where you live in paradise. Could you please uh, meet me there, please? David is worried about his mom being bedridden and all and uh, not to mention her glaucoma. He thinks that the nurses aren't going to show up because of the eye. Because of that, he's going to fly back to Colorado for a few days. Dad, everyone is starting to panic. Charles responded, Yeah, I just, I just took three shots of whiskey, so let me slam an energy drink and, and then I'll be on the road. A lot of military people are moving around, and so hopefully they, they won't make traveling too hard. Lauren responded, Dad, you better not drink an energy drink. You know you have a heart condition. Like seriously, just wait an hour before leaving, as it, it will be a five to six hour flight. There's no rush. Okay, let the buzz wear off. But anyway, I have to get going. I love you, and I, I hope to see you soon. Charles placed his car keys on the table and looked outside. He noticed a man dressed in black fatigues pacing up and down the street. Charles approached the window and studied him. Black boots, helmet, rifle, a soldier. Charles thought, okay, they are probably keeping people in their homes. He has a gun and he is probably authorized to use it. How the hell can I get out of here? He thought about his vehicles. An old pickup truck, which should have died 15 years ago, still ran as though it were new. His talent for fixing up vehicles and keeping them running was evident in the condition of his truck. Though it was a 1995 Ford Ranger with more than 200,000 miles on it, it still purred. He rebuilt the engine once, replaced the transmission, and repaired a blown head gasket and managed to keep even the slightest speck of rust off the truck. The electric car his daughter bought him? Well, it hasn't moved in two years and rust is already licking up the side of the door. This ranger meant something else to him. For reasons he couldn't explain, it reminded him of what he lost. And though the truck should have been retired more than a decade ago, it keeps running and he fixes whatever needs to be fixed. He has the soul of a mechanic and a rebel. Charles realized what he had to do to escape, peel out and just keep driving. He sat on the couch for nearly an hour before the buzz wore off. The soldier outside never stopped pacing, and Charles lost count of how many military vehicles drove off into the desert. Charles stood up, stretched, and stumbled into the garage. There he was greeted by the scent of oil and machinery. This garage has seen a lot of mechanical work, and the floor keeps no secrets. Hunks of wood, well, safety blocks, sit against the wall. He grabbed a few and threw them into the truck bed. A toolbox and a spare tire were thrown into the bed as well. He walked to the other side of his garage and examined his gasoline cans. He had three three-gallon jugs. They were secured beneath his workbench 
and the caps were screwed on tight. The gasoline was intended for his lawnmower and weed eater, but he saw now was a good time to take it. He slipped the gas cans into a milk jug crate and placed the crate into the back of his car. Once he had loaded up the truck, he strapped down the gasoline so it wouldn't move and double-checked that all the caps were secure and shut. He knew there would only be one chance to get up and out of Paradise, Nevada. He hoped the big guy with the gun wouldn't fire at him as he drove down the street. Charles entered his truck, rolled up the windows, and cranked the engine. The ranger purred to life and sat idle. Charles glanced at his watch, nodded, and opened the garage door. As the door rose, the soldier outside stood still and watched. Charles smiled, for as soon as the door opened, he peeled out of the garage and made a beeline for the street. As he approached, the soldier tried to wave him down and even raised his gun. Exercising restraint, he did not pull the trigger because he knew that everyone was likely going home to meet with their family. He wondered, why was he standing there, wasting his time trying to make sure no one left their home? Charles pushed on the accelerator and ran over his own mailbox and thumped onto the curve before fishtailing into the street. He corrected the truck and pushed the pedal to the floor and smiled as he sped down the road. Once he left the city limits of paradise, he found himself in the midst of a desert split in half by a single highway. The road stretched far beyond the horizon. Charles received another text message from one of his poker buddies, but he ignored it. It's not safe to text and drive, even if the world is about to end. Paradise shrank as the distance between him and his home grew. Charles gazed down the long stretch of highway, and there he saw the empty space before him peel open. The eye returned. Stars, galaxies, and the night sky concealed the top and bottom of the eye as though it were an eyelid. Tucked behind this lid made of space and time, the enormous eye glared upon Charles. His hands tightened against the wheel as his heart raced. The eye remained fixed on him as he took his foot off the gas pedal and allowed the truck to roll to a complete stop. His fingertips tingled as his palms began to sweat. He wasn't sure if he should proceed forward or turn back. The truck rolled to a complete stop as Charles studied the eye. He stepped out and walked about 10 feet forward. The pupil did not resemble a human's pupil. It was similar to a cat or a lizard. A reptilian eye, hazel iris, flecked with gold and emerald, and a pupil encircled by a slight wash of blue, as though water was inside the eye and falling from the iris into the pupil, as though it were a pit. The eye shifted and Charles began to tremble. The bottom of the eyelid rested just above the desert's horizon. Charles looked straight up and saw that the top eyelid ended above his head, far off in the night sky. Clouds and a plane passed between him and the eye. It shifted once more and moved. What it searched for, Charles did not know, but he could tell that by the way it moved, it was searching for something. He blinked hard a few times and waited. What else could he do at this moment? Stars, galaxies, and the night sky didn't seem to be affected by the eye's movement and remained fixed in place, much like a bead of black oil moving through water. 
The eye moved down the horizon until half of it was gone. Charles returned to his truck, started the engine, and drove down the highway. As he did so, the eye moved once more until its pupil rested at the end of the horizon, thus creating the illusion that Charles could somehow drive into the pupil. The eyelid shut, and it seemed as though the eye was never there to begin with. Charles began to sweat as he realized the thing could move. He pushed harder against the gas pedal, because what kind of cop would give him a speeding ticket during a time like this? He eased off the gas, because he remembered that there's probably at least one. Charles had driven for about an hour before he pulled over and topped off his truck. The gas station he stopped at was old and still had the short pumps built into the ground and they dinged with every gallon he took. Try as hard as he might to keep his Ranger running smoothly, he knew that the old girl guzzled gas faster than he could down a bottle of Jack on a lonely night. As the truck filled, he double-checked his gas cans and the objects inside. It took a minute for him to realize the gas station was without a single employee, and he knew why. He entered the gas station, a drab old place trapped in the 80s, and picked up a few bags of chips, sodas, and beef jerky for the drive to Vegas. The hot dog rollers still rolled, and the slushy machine still spun. The unnerving silence made Charles' stomach drop as he stood still. Even the cash register was unlocked, but Charles didn't pay any attention to that. He may be a drunk, but he's not a thief. A payphone next to an ATM caught his attention. He approached it and then proceeded to lift the receiver. Busy tone, and then silence. For reasons unknown, the phone did not work. He double-checked his items to make sure he had enough to last a three-hour drive, and then shrugged a $20 bill into the register. A smirk crossed his face because he knew that money was useless at this point and doubted that this alien creature, or god, or whatever it was, didn't traverse the ocean of space to just stare at them. Any intelligent being can do that with cameras. After the snacks and drinks had been collected, and the most important thing of all, booze were secured, he cranked his truck and sat idle at the gas pump. He felt like the eye belonged in a drunkard's dream. He shuddered as he thought about the eye and what it wants. Surely nothing would cross the cosmos to do something good, no. He figured alien beings would be just as self-serving as humans. If a creature came here from another dimension, it would likely do so for reasons that humans don't agree with. He returned to the highway and drove for 40 minutes toward Las Vegas. As he traveled in the black of night, the folds of the sky opened once more and revealed the eye. It was in a different position than before but just as big. His heart didn't drop this time, but it was still rather difficult to figure out what to do. He could tell that the eye was closer to Earth than the moon was, but was far enough away to appear behind the veil of the atmosphere. Though it was dark, Charles figured his guess was right. The eye must be somewhere near the... His heart sank. Near the satellites. He thought of Lauren, who was likely already in a plane and in the air. A thought persisted, despite his reservations. It's watching me. In an obtuse sense, yes. The eye was watching him. But the eye was watching everything it could see. Much like when he studied an ant colony before setting them ablaze with his magnifying glass. Charles did not stare at one ant but all of them. He did not burn just one ant. He tried to burn them all. Charles guessed this eye was doing the same thing. Studying, watching, thinking, 
It shifted in the sky, and from deep within its pupil emerged three bony fingers. They wrapped around the left side of the pupil, and then three more fingers emerged on the right. Something drew its face from the depth of the pupil, and peeked at the world in the same fashion a child would peer through a window. The fingers clasped at the edge of the iris and touched the whites of the enormous eye. Charles studied the massive eye while slowing down on the highway. It was then he saw it, something resembling a head within the pupil. Four eyes, tucked beneath ebony chitin folds, reflected what little light was available. Charles swallowed the knot forming in his throat and slowed the ranger. The head and fingers of the creature retreated into the pupil and then time and space itself froze as the eyelid closed. Once again, the eye vanished into nothingness. Charles felt himself freeze in time as ribbons of clouds stopped rolling and dust froze in the air. All he could see at the very bottom of his field of vision was that the speedometer on his truck read 38 miles per hour, yet he didn't move. The eye, he knew the eye, and what he saw had something to do with the frozen moment in which he found himself. Folds of space split open and revealed the veiny bottom of the eyeball. It rolled upwards until its iris and pupil arose over the horizon. Time resumed and Charles felt his body quake as the passage of time returned to normal. He skidded off the road and careened into a cactus over a few small boulders and then a large one. Charles turned the wheel but his attempts were in vain. The ranger bumped and bounced over too many cacti and small boulders until Charles collected his composure and steered the ranger back onto the road. But now he heard something knocking near the back of his truck. Clunk, clunk, clunk. He bit his lip because he knew what that knocking meant. Something damaged the transmission, likely a boulder. Though he felt the need to check on his vehicle, he knew that if the transmission were broken, there'd be nothing he could do and the truck would eventually die. Charles progressed toward the massive eye and as he stared at it, it stared at him. A single black tendril slithered and spiraled out of the eye's pupil. It crashed into the earth about 20 miles away from where he was. He jolted in his seat and the shockwave of the impact pushed against him. Another tendril, black as pitch and as wide as a building, erupted from the pupil, but this one impaled the earth less than a mile from where he was. A plume of dirt and debris erupted from the point of impact as the black stalk pierced the planet. Another tendril emerged, and then another, and another, and soon there were more tendrils than he could count. Charles continued to travel onward, toward the eye, and by now he knew he was halfway to Las Vegas. Unfortunately, the ranger began to sputter. It jumped as he tried to drive faster until, at last, it accelerated no more. Once the ranger rolled to a complete stop, he left the truck and looked up at the eye. The whites had become bloodshot and now the eye looked infected. From the pupil of the hideous eye were countless tendrils gouging the planet. They began to glow a soft orange, and the air around him felt hotter than it usually did. Charles gave this thought no heed as he gazed up at the sky. Military crafts buzzed around black stalks which fed into the pupil. He prayed for his daughter's safety and opened his bottle of Jack. Small segments of bright orange flowed up the stalks and into the pupil. Charles closed his eyes and imagined. This was all just a nightmare. Lauren looked out of her airplane window. She tried to count the black tendrils but could not. There were too many. They harpooned through the sky and impaled the earth, one right after another. 
They seemed to come without end, and Lauren wondered how they were going to survive this plane flight. She grabbed David's hand and questioned whether they would have been better off in the Bahamas, but decided against it. The eye was visible down there, and it's likely that these tendrils were puncturing anything the eye could see. As the pilot wove past tendril after tendril, Lauren watched helplessly as some of these tendrils tore through planes, buildings, and the earth. Her stomach turned as she watched the tendril dig deep enough to expose the orange glow of liquid iron, only for it to be hidden by dirt and debris as it was pushed around while the tendrils dug deep and then deeper. She noticed that the black tendrils didn't always appear to be black. There were sections which glowed orange and she guessed that this thing, whatever it was, was drinking the liquid iron core of the planet each tendril no more than a mouth, no less than a straw. They sucked the liquid layer from the planet and left behind a gaping chasm in its wake. The solid iron core of the planet reflected what little light it could, only for it to be concealed by dirt and debris. Smoke emerged from these gaping chasms as the core of the planet burned all that touched it. And one by one, for each tendril, a new chasm was born. Lauren gazed at the planet below and refused to look out the window on the other side of the plane, because the eye would be ever closer. She pulled the blind down and looked away from the world below her. David squeezed her hand and this brought her back from the edge of destruction she had just witnessed. He said, it was a beautiful wedding. Lauren glanced at her engagement ring and wedding band. She thought of the reception and her father walking her down the aisle. A beautiful wedding held outside in a vineyard. A wonderful reception where her friend's band played their hearts out. She couldn't remember ever seeing her father so happy. She missed him in that moment. She said, don't start dooming and glooming us. The sound of explosions erupted outside the plane. Lauren wanted to lift the blinder and peer out the window, but she knew ignorance truly is bliss. Though she tried to ignore the possibility of death, she flirted with the idea of heaven. She thought, if a tendril impaled the plane, would I be greeted by my mom, Bethany, and Sarah? Would they be grown now, or would they be older or younger? Lauren glanced down, maybe death would be a path to a reunion, but the moments before that holy union would be wrought with fire and the twisting of a plane. Perhaps her death would be slow and enraged embers would bite her body until it was blackened. She shuddered as she came to regret ever allowing herself to imagine her own death and looked out the window. Military planes flew about, they wove between the tendrils and fired missiles at them, but it was all in vain. The iron core continued to be sucked from the planet, and the eye itself was too far away to strike. Whatever the tendrils were made of, they could withstand the blast of rockets and constant gunfire. Lauren removed her phone and dialed for her dad. He answered, and she said, Dad, Dad. I'm up at the sky and, and these tendrils are plummeting through planes like their paper and I can see them digging into the middle of the earth. Dad, I love you. Charles said, I know, listen, I, I see it all down here, but anyway, I'm, I'm going to foot it as much as I can. If I don't talk to you again, I want you to know that I love you. I love David too, but, um, you know, not as much. Lauren chuckled. Okay, thanks for that, but <laughs> I just wanted to try and call you. The pilot is trying to land as soon as possible, but can't because everyone else is landing as soon as possible. Dad, I love you, and I, I hope this isn't a goodbye. Charles said. I know, sweetheart. I, I hope not, too, but, um, you know, I, I love you and I'll see you soon. 
Lauren stared at the phone for a moment as she thought about her father. Maybe it hurt too much for him to talk right now, or perhaps there were other things he had to do or he was driving. She knew they couldn't talk forever, but wanted to remain on the phone for as long as possible. She studied her phone and watched as her cellular bars went from two bars to no service. She said, so how long before the electrical grid and everything else is wiped out? David sat for a moment and pondered the question. He guessed a few good shots at key power areas would do the trick. Lauren double-checked her phone while David tried to call his parents. She opened a photo album which held pictures of her when she was three, Charles, Sarah when she was eight, her oldest sister, Bethany, when she was ten, and her mother, Belle. She browsed through the album and found her favorite a Christmas photo. She scrolled through them looking for a source of comfort but found dismay. She opened the video of her first birthday and watched as everyone gathered around her. She wondered what her sisters would look like now, how her mother would have been. Lauren began to question whether her father would have ever developed an alcohol addiction or if they would have all grown up as a normal family should. Her train of thought was broken by the buzz of a speaker. The plane intercom clicked on and the captain said, Hello, it is I, uh, your captain. Um, we have lost communication with uh, air control. As such, we will do our best to land in the desert. We are about four minutes out from Las Vegas, but we deduce that there is in no clear definitive way a safe way to land this plane. We believe these things falling from the sky impaled a critical satellite, and because of that, our global positioning system is no longer functional. Please engage your seatbelts and hold on as best as you can. I will begin making our descent soon. Lauren's eyes widened, her stomach lifted as the plane began to suddenly descend. She grabbed onto David's hand and opened the blinder for the window. Somehow, everything had gotten worse. More tendrils, more fire, and part of the earth seemed to have caved in on itself. A valley, which she assumed once held a city, had sunken in. A split had formed across the planet and veered into a place unknown farther than she could see. She closed her eyes and tried to not think of her dad. Where is he? Where is he going? Is he in that chasm? No matter how hard she tried to push these thoughts away, they came. They persisted. She thought, I already lost my sisters and mom. I can't lose my dad too, or my husband. The intercom blared to life once again. It's your captain. Uh, we will touch land in 10 minutes. For the sake of your knowledge, we are near Henderson, Nevada, a 45 minute walk from Las Vegas. We will do our best to land as close to the highway as possible, but bear in mind, we are landing on rocky terrain and we will do our best to ensure a safe landing. Lauren gritted her teeth and held on to David. She thought, Henderson, southeast of paradise. We can walk to my dad. She squeezed David's hand and held onto her armrest. The plane bobbed from left to right. The intercom returned to life. Landing in two minutes, brace for impact. I wish you all good luck and a safe landing. As the plane teetered from side to side, Lauren felt vomit emerge in the back of her throat as her stomach turned. She squeezed David's hand tight as the plane touched the ground. She closed her eyes and heard a snap, and all at once the plane jerked forward and then back, forward, and then back. Someone began to scream as children began to cry. The engines roared and suddenly the plane turned left and everyone in the plane felt the right side get pushed into their seat. The plane careened forward until the nose dug into the ground and soon heat, unbearable heat, and the roar of an explosion.
Charles had abandoned his truck and began walking down I-215. Far in the distance, he saw a plane try to land in the desert. Perhaps five miles out from where he was, and from what he could tell, the plane's left wing dug into the uneven earth, and from the cockpit spat a single ball of fire. He hoped that his daughter was on that plane, but knew that she'd be lucky to land anywhere no matter where she was. As he walked down the highway, he turned his sight toward the gargantuan eye. Tens of thousands of tendrils punctured the earth and fed right into its pupil. The blood vessels had swollen and glowed orange. The whites had now become yellow and the iris resembled a color mixed with crimson and orange fire. Though the eye did not move, blink, or shift, it remained frozen in a blank stare as more tendrils spiraled out of its pupil and gouged the earth. They moved like hagfish hunting a carcass and bore into the planet. A vast pit formed in the wake of the tendrils' destruction. Chasms left behind in the place of consumed iron had formed into entire valleys. As the liquid iron core of the planet was drained, there was little to hold up the planet's mantle or crust. Charles felt the world beneath his feet shift. The highway split here and there, and some parts lifted, only to recede a moment later. He pressed on, and the air surrounding him had become hot. Sweat formed on his back and created a thin film against his forehead. As he walked, he surmised that the cause of this heat was due to the eye drinking the liquid iron core and the exposure of the solid core. Earthquakes near and far shook the ground in which he walked. In his right hand was a bottle of Jack Daniels, and he sipped from it every so often. It burned as it passed down his throat, and this reminded him that everything he bore witness to was real. The world was collapsing. The enormous eye, the simple fact that the military was using every ounce of its might to dissuade this thing to no avail. What was there to care for in such extreme times? Just one thing. He thought of his daughter, and knew that if he could get to her, his death might not be so bad. Lauren felt something on her back. It burned, throbbed. It wouldn't go away. The air felt hot, and she heard someone moving about. There were two women shoveling people out of the airplane. She laid beside a group of three people. Her right forearm had been broken, and a cut was across her right cheek. She rolled over and looked at the airplane, if only to find her husband. He emanated from the crumbled remains of the aircraft as a sudden burst of fire billowed from the windows. People scattered away from the airplane and screamed as fire brushed against them. David, she couldn't find him. Lauren brushed her hair behind her ears and tried to see clearly. The plane, the people, everything was blurry and muffled. Lauren waved for one of the girls, and though impatient, a short woman pointed at a pile of corpses resting beside the plane. Staring at the blurry shape of her husband, Lauren blinked. Time and sound froze as her vision sharpened and the shape of her husband took form. David had been split open, nearly cut in half on his right side. She screamed but could not hear her own voice. Everything was still muffled. She struggled to find her feet and limped to her husband. Parts of him she did not want to see remained on display, and she ignored them. The entrails, exposed fat and muscle, bone. She ignored it all. Tears edged at the corner of her eyes and then fell as she drew closer. As the heat intensified and David's fate became crystal clear, Lauren began to quiver. Her jaw trembled as her head shook. The heat became too much and she could not move closer. Lauren said, I'm sorry, but I have to go to my dad. His limpid eyes gazed upwards toward the foul creature above. The eye, 
The all-encompassing eye glowed orange and burgundy, and now pus formed at the edges of its interdimensional eyelid. Lauren shrieked as she realized the scope of what was happening to Earth. She did not want to leave him, but knew that there was nothing else she could do. He had been split open, and that was that. She tried to call her father, but forgot that service was no more. While she looked up, the clouds began to dissolve. The purple halo which sat at the edge of the horizon faded. Sheer and absolute blackness peppered by stars was the backdrop against the enormous eye. The once beautiful purple and blue horizon vanished with the last bit of clouds. She knew what this meant. The eye is taking the iron core in its entirety, and because of that, the magnetic field surrounding the planet faded, until ultimately, it was no more. She knew what this meant. Soon everyone and everything will perish. Charles walked down I-215 with a bottle of Jack in his hand and a pack of smokes in his pocket. He hadn't tasted tobacco since the passing of his wife because she found the taste of it appalling. In honor of her, he put his last pack in the glove box of his ranger the day after her funeral and there they remained until now. The whiskey kept the edge off and he didn't mind too much about the world around him only Lauren. The risk of lung cancer was a moot point now that a giant eyeball was eating the core of the planet. Charles took a drag and coughed a bit. The good old sensation of sucking down a lung full of smoke had been lost to time, but that didn't matter. He knew his daughter was out there, somewhere, perhaps in the plane wreckage ahead of him, but he wasn't sure. The idea that she could be a charred corpse or mangled or in pieces caused him to slow his steps. He felt that too much had already been lost in his life and could tell from the monstrosity before him that all he had to do was wait just a little bit longer and then it would be his time to die along with everyone else on the planet. Charles smirked as he thought about the idea of everyone perishing at once. He looked around, and the tendrils, which were innumerable at this point, reminded him of a forest. A forest made of black trees, and those trees stretched into the pupil of the all-seeing eye, pulsating and wiggling about like sea lamprey. The tendrils did not so much as flinch as the military shot them, bombed them, and tried to destroy them. Charles took a few steps and smirked because he knew he was the only person on I-215, yet there were at least 8 billion people on the planet. Half of these people were staring into the same hideous eye he was, and the people on the other side of the planet may have no clue what's happening. He chuckled as he realized everyone is just as doomed as he was. The poor, millionaires, billionaires, Nazardin cared for no one and nothing. He imagined this is how he would feel if he watched an asteroid barrel toward Earth or a second Black Death or worse, maybe another interdimensional god would come down to Earth and slurp up the water or eat the Earth's mantle, or perhaps there was one which fed solely on human skin. If this giant eye could exist in the way it does, why couldn't there be something more hideous? perhaps more personal, and not so indifferent. In a sort of weird way, Charles felt he could relate to the eye. He said, You ain't no different from me when I was getting on with lunch at the gas station. Pick up a burger, a bag of chips, a soda, and eat it without even thinking about it. Just hungry, not caring about nothing. Charles sucked down a puff of smoke and unzipped his pants. He said, Hope you like the taste of p***s, because here you go, you f***er. He relieved himself on the side of the road and took another sip of whiskey. 
He marched onward toward the plane wreckage closer to the eye and felt he was in a drunken daydream. With a bottle of Jack in hand and a pack of smokes in his pocket, Charles wasn't about to let an interdimensional god ruin his buzz. He gave the eye the middle finger and walked toward the plane wreckage. Lauren felt the bone in her forearm shift and the pain which resulted from that movement seared through the entirety of her arm. She winced as she tried to at least fashion it with a stick and string found in the wreckage. She figured an impromptu stint would make her broken forearm manageable. There wasn't much time left and she knew it. She stood up and noticed the long stretch of highway about 200 feet away. Though she didn't know the area, she knew that the plane was facing Vegas, as that is where it was heading. Because of that, she guessed Vegas was to her right and Paradise was to her left. Once she stood up, she began to veer left and walk away from Vegas, toward where she thought her dad would be. Once she arrived at the interstate, she looked down at it and saw a small figure far, far off in the distance. She hoped it was her father. As she began to walk, she turned around and faced the eye once more. From what she could tell, there weren't any more tendrils to spit out, and the eye, once burgundy and orange, had now started to fade to ebony. The iris and the whites around it had become dark. Flecks within it, which were red, orange, and bright, had become slivers of gray. She wondered if the eye was dying and thought about how, when volcanoes erupt, the lava becomes black once it cools and she figured this is what was happening to the eye. As she began to walk down the interstate, the road beneath her feet began to split. No sooner, the sound of an explosion erupted from behind her. She turned around hastily and noticed one of the tendrils retreating into the eye and in its wake was a cloud of brown earth. Another tendril retracted from the planet and into the eye. Lauren stood still for a moment, watching as tendrils ripped the earth apart as they retreated into the pupil. The interstate split in half toward the horizon and vast chunks of earth were flung into the sky. She knew that these chunks were going to fall as quickly as they rose. As fast as she could, she dodged any shadow that formed at her feet and glanced over her shoulder to make sure she was not crushed. As more tendrils removed themselves from the planet and coiled into the eye, chunks of earth as large as a football field or as small as a car became airborne. Lauren ran faster, but she felt it was in vain because the pieces of earth went where they wanted to fall. She sprinted and no sooner found that the person far off in the distance was running toward her, though wobbling to and fro in a drunken sprint. As the distance between them closed, Lauren sighed in relief once she realized it was her dad and tried not to laugh when she noticed the liquor in his hand. They embraced each other and hugged. Charles held his daughter, and Lauren took care not to hurt her arm any more than she needed to. Charles said, Where's, where's David? Lauren pointed at the plane wreckage and said, uh, He's back there. Not good. He's not doing good at all. Charles bit his lip, and his heart sank. He said, I'm sorry that that happened to you, but uh, at least this thing is taking its, uh, whatever those things are back now. That's a good thing, right? Lauren turned and faced the eye. Most of the tendrils had receded into the pupil as the debris left in their wake fell from the sky. The remaining tendrils beyond the horizon snapped back into the eye. A few minutes passed, and the surface of the planet resembled something close to a piece of wood shot by buckshot. 
holes as wide and long as a building were everywhere, and they left the iron core exposed. As the eye stared at them, they stared at it. It had become black, and within the pupil, small fingers stretched out of it. Charles had seen this before, the small creature with four eyes but without a face. Long, black, chitinous fingers reached around the edge of the blackened iris and groped at its edge. Eyes, four of them in black, and the flat head it was attached to emerged from the pupil. Its body was long and flat, similar to a centipede, and on each side of its body were long, spider-like legs. It swam through the air and out of the pupil. The eye it came from didn't move or show any signs of life as the small creature departed from it. As it spiraled into the void of space, its body did not seem to have an end. Suddenly, it focused on a point of space and bit at it. No sooner its head passed through a cut, much like a tick burrowing into flesh. The creature passed into a realm no one could see. Its body slithered into the gash of space for a few minutes. Charles surmised that this creature had to have been at least a mile in length, considering how large it was from such a vast distance away, and how long it took for it to pass from the pupil of the eye into the pocket of space it made. At last, the tail of the creature entered the slit in space, and then, all at once, it seemed as though the creature never existed. Charles felt that that animal, that thing which was in the eye was Nazardin. Not the eye itself, but that creature. And those tendrils came from it, and for whatever reason, it needed the eye, but now it did not need it. Charles wondered what kind of parasite could infect an eye of such magnitude, and what animal would be so large in scale that it would be in possession of such an eye, and its eye alone would encompass half the planet. His stomach quaked as he thought about it. He wondered if what appeared to be a god to him and others of this planet was no more than an interdimensional parasite that infects its host, steals its eye, and then feeds on the core of planets. He wondered if this is why it studied Earth before it impaled it with its tendrils. Charles thought, it's not an interdimensional space god. It's a pissed off snake lizard with four eyes. It's a parasite, like the kind of people who run for public office. He snickered and leaned away from his daughter. Lauren turned around and gazed at the eye. Together, they gawked at it, as though somehow they still couldn't believe it was there. The eye didn't move, shift, or turn. It remained still in the sky, dead, with yellow pus at the edges of its would-be eyelids, lids made of the night sky, a twilight dotted with stars in the black void of space. Its pupil seemed endless and the iris dried out as it took on the texture of burning charcoal, its cracks and fissures still glowing orange. Both of them, though they didn't speak it, agreed that the eye was likely dead. Charred and now a husk forever gazing at the planet it killed. Charles imagined what the situation must look like from space or from the perspective of a distant traveler. Planet Earth, no longer glowing blue because its atmosphere had been weakened under the gaze of a black eye which appeared to be made of charcoal. The eye itself, as tall and wide as the planet, staring at the ruin it left behind, unfazed, unaware, dead lone in the void of space and trapped in time. There this eye would remain until it, too, was either ripped to pieces by forces unknown or floated endlessly, alone, in the vast expanse of the universe, unknowing, staring, dead and blind. He shuddered as he pushed the thought out of his head. 
The deed had been done. What else could he do now? Charles passed the bottle of Jack to Lauren. She grabbed it and took a sip. Alcohol was never something she enjoyed, but saw no reason to object since her death was now waiting. She said, Sure. <laughs> Why the hell not? Suddenly, they felt as if they were descending down an elevator, and it was then they noticed the earth split, and a rift became a valley, then a canyon, then a chasm formed before them. The opposite end of the chasm rose as they appeared to sink. Gravity did what it always does and pulled. The earth itself, now without a liquid iron core, began to collapse inward upon itself. Much like a millipede curling into a ball or a snake wrapping into a coil preparing to strike, the earth began to fold in on itself at its weakest point. Charles and Lauren stood in awe as the distant edge of the chasm rose 50 feet above them, then 100, 200, a thousand feet, and soon not even the eye could be seen, only the red hot mantle of the planet, still angry and dripping with red hot liquid iron. Together they stood before the yawning mouth of the planet and at the edge of its throat was its solid iron core, wet with orange magma. Lauren realized the earth had split in two and from where they were they could see the empty space on the other side of the planet just above the solid iron core. The stars and galaxies glittered no differently and suddenly the planet groaned and they felt their feet lift from the grass. The earth they stood upon fell away from them. Since the liquid layer of the iron core had been consumed, the pull of gravity had weakened and they slowly fell as the ground beneath them dropped 10 feet, then 20, then 50, and suddenly stopped. As they stood together on the cusp of the chasm, they noticed it became harder to breathe. Now that the magnetic field surrounding the planet was gone and the sun was stripping away the atmosphere, oxygen had started to escape the planet. Charles closed his eyes and reached for his daughter's hand. They both knew their demise was imminent. Charles said, I'm glad. He sucked in a deep breath of air. Glad in the last days, last days of my life will be with, with you. Laura nodded as she too found it difficult to breathe. As the other edge of the planet continued to rise, he noticed the split at the opposite end of them grow. Half of the planet was floating above the other half. The earth beneath their feet fell away from them once more, but this time it rolled forward. Charles took another sip of Jack as he slowly floated in the air and descended to the earth's surface. As he stood in a drunken haze, he looked at the other half of the planet, dangling as though it were attached to invisible strings, suspended in space. He knew it was a matter of time before gravity did its thing and pulled it down upon them. He lit a cigarette, which was a hassle to do as the oxygen level had dropped significantly. He grabbed another cigarette and passed it to his daughter. Charles said, You know, I, I gave this eye the pit earlier. <laughs> Lauren laughed. I, I, I don't, I don't know. She sucked in a deep breath. Don't, don't know if it's, if it's oxygen deprivation or what, but... <laughs> That's hilarious. Whole world is going to end and you're trying, she coughed, trying to make the thing take the pit. <laughs> oh gosh. The ground fell away from them again. And once they landed, they walked up I-215. 
as it seemed the earth was folding in and rolling into itself towards the eye. Charles said, How's that arm? Lauren turned her arm over and rubbed it. It hurt, but pain didn't matter at this point. Death was imminent. She said, oh, Been better. So, Dad, since, since we're obviously not going to make it, I want to say thank you for everything. Absolutely everything. Charles nodded and kicked at a few rocks beside his foot. He said, You know, I'm I'm sorry for a lot of a lot of the stuff a lot of the stuff I did. The stuff I, I didn't do, the stuff I should have done. I think I think people with kids realize once they're grown that it's really easy to make mistakes. Sometimes we do what our parents did because we don't know no better, and then we don't do any better than they did. A vast shadow encompassed them as half of the planet passed over them. Charles and Lauren gawked at the floating monstrosity overhead. The iron had cooled and become solid, and from what they could tell, the planet had taken on a somewhat flat shape and started to crunch together at the middle. The iron core's gravity was now pulling the planet back together. Lauren said, Dad, don't. I, I know your drinking problem began after the accident, and that's okay. I'm sorry for fighting with you about it and trying to change you so that way I wouldn't have to change. I realize now you were stressed, you were a stressed out single father who didn't know what to do was dealing with mom's death, the death of two of your children, and my own bull****. You had the whole world and my world on your shoulders, and all I had to worry about was myself. Either way, you were always there, even when I didn't want you to be or want to listen. Unfortunately, I didn't realize I could actually hurt someone. Charles nodded. Don't kid yourself. I, I couldn't put the bottle down and two DWIs and a crying toddler in the back seat should, should have been enough of a, of a wake up call. I admit I was a piece of crap, but Sometimes you just get so depressed that you just don't care what you do, who you hurt, or who might miss you if you decide to check out early one day. For a moment that didn't seem as though it were going to end, the upper half of the planet no longer moved away. Charles and Lauren noticed this and studied it. They watched the space between the two halves of the earth and soon, the space between them began to shrink. The two halves of the planet were now gravitationally locked and moving toward each other. Charles said, Looks like all of this is going to crush us. Unless you think we can cross half the planet in less than 15 minutes. I suggest we just lay back and enjoy it, I guess. Lauren sat down in the interstate and extended her hand for another cigarette. She lit it up and filled her lungs with smoke. She said, I, I, ugh, ugh, how do you smoke these things? God, they're terrible. Charles laughed. I just, I just put them in and, and take a puff and hey, <laughs> In my defense, I ain't smoked in a long time. Anyway, how was your honeymoon? 
Lauren laughed. Dad, this, <laughs> this oxygen depletion, it's making me loopy and be because this shouldn't be funny, but <laughs> considering I was just in the Bahamas, Lauren thought for a moment and said, hypoxia, that's what it's called. <laughs> and, and us drinking whiskey is, <laughs> it's just making the hypoxia worse. And well, all things considered, making it better. Charles smiled, right? All things, all things considered. <laughs> I suppose since we can't do anything, we might as well sit around and get drunk. Only got maybe 15 minutes left, right? Lauren looked beyond the horizon and into the space between the two folds of the planet, which was now closing. She said, Oh yeah. Based on the research other scientists have done on giant space monsters eating the outer core of the planets and those planets collapsing. <sighs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 15 minutes is typical. Yes, Dad. We have 15 minutes. Charles chuckled and puffed on a cigarette. He didn't know if he felt at ease because of the hypoxia or alcohol or the fact that he knew death was imminent, but he felt a sense of ease knowing that neither he or his daughter would have to die alone. A global catastrophe such as this left everyone with nowhere to go, nowhere to escape, and because the atmosphere will soon be scrubbed away, all will perish. The top half of the planet made its descent and covered the bottom half the same way a large sheet of paper covers a small one. As the top half of the planet drifted farther overhead and inched closer, darkness encompassed them. Lauren removed her cell phone and turned on the flashlight. The screen was cracked, but the phone still did its job. She shined the flashlight onto her father, who had decided to lay down on the pavement. He said, I'm feeling extremely dizzy and it's getting really hard to catch my breath. Lauren leaned down beside him and scooted next to his arm. She said, it's hypoxia. Soon I imagine we'll start, we'll start feeling like we're suffocating. Charles said, that stupid other half better fall now. I, I don't want to go through that. He squeezed her hand and said, you would have been a fantastic doctor. At least you won't have to worry about student loans. Lauren laughed. Maybe Maybe in another life I can, but I, I can't default on, on student loans. <laughs> Even if the world is ending, the government will still try to figure out how, how to get that money, even if I'm dead. She coughed and felt her throat begin to tighten. Together they wheezed and the sound of earth crashing into itself surfaced. Lauren said, Love you, Dad. She waited for his response and heard nothing. As she lay down, she refused to look at him and imagined that he said he loved her as well. The warmth of his hand diminished. Lauren released it. She lifted her father's lifeless arm and wrapped herself with it. She too began to wheeze and struggled to catch her breath until she could catch it no more. There they lay on I-25, father and daughter. Not a breeze pushed against them as the top half of the planet fell upon them and everyone else. As the eye remained in space, the planet took on its new shape, something resembling an oblong potato. And due to the lack of atmospheric pressure, 
the oceans across the world either spilled into open space or boiled off where they were. One by one, species after species succumbed to the lack of oxygen. The forests, savannas, and oceans were teeming with corpses. The cities, interstates, countries, and tribes were brimming with carcasses. And the eye, repulsive and disgusting as it was, watched with a vacant stare. It watched as hours became days, and days became months, and months became years, and years became centuries. Hey, what's up? If you made it this far, it's probably because you enjoyed Nazredin. And and thank you for sticking around for so long. Because it's, you know, these stories are long and, you know, sometimes they take a bit of extra time. But, um, so this is the thoughts part of the video where I talk about the origin of the story. And this time I'm recording the thoughts after... The entire project is done because when I did the project before this one, the Church of Sin, I did the thoughts before I did the Lost Tapes. But this time, Lost Tapes are done, they're uploaded, Nazardin is done, it's uploaded with the exception of the YouTube video because this part is going to be included in that. But um, the way I've been doing things is I'll write the main story first. And then I will write the Lost Tapes stories after that. So the goal with the Lost Tapes stories is I want them to be standalone stories, but I also want them to be optional prelude stories, which serve more as an enhancement to the original story. So you could watch Nazredin or The Church of Sin or any other a uh, long big video I do and it's not necessary to watch the Lost Tapes episodes to understand what's going on in the story while also create creating an experience where you can watch the Lost Tapes and it teases you for the story about to come but when I was working on Nazardin's Last Tapes uh, <laughs> I didn't I was trying to construct a cohesive story spread across the six astrophysicists who were kind of responsible for bringing Nazard into um, their universe. And I tried my best to do it. I'm not very confident in the, the six stories that I wove. I like the Nazard story, I do. But as for the Lost Tapes episodes, I, um, I, I tried my best with them, and I'm not sure how they're going to do. I'm not even really sure how Nazardin's going to do, because I don't know how people are going to feel about uh, tentacles shooting out of an eyeball and sucking the core out of the planet, and the story is pretty much about... <laughs> Charles and Lauren reconnecting on a highway and Charles literally doesn't do anything he walks down the street 
he goes to a no he goes he gets in his truck and he leaves he drives and then he goes to a gas station he gets um, uh, in this weird time bubble and then goes off the road ruins his car but before he does that he goes to a gas station and he's pretty much walking and then Lauren is pretty much in an airplane and then she's walking to him but I really liked the way this story worked out and I had I had a lot of fun writing the entire project I had a lot of fun writing Nazardin and the Lost Tapes but like I said earlier I don't know <laughs> I don't know how they're going to do or how people are going to feel about them. I think I'm a little anxious about it because uh, this is my first cosmic god. And uh, I have more planned. But for right now, you know, focusing on one project at a time. Right now, it's uh, Nazruddin's turn. But, uh... So let's talk a little bit about Nazardin and what it is and what its rules are. Because if somebody else wants to take that monster, that cosmic god, and use it, go right on ahead. But the, I guess you could say the rules of Nazardin are, are this. Nazardin is the creature inside of the eyeball. And the eyeball the reason why it's so massive is because Nazardin, since it's a cosmic god, it can alter things and it made the eyeball huge. So there isn't a creature out there in the universe that is big enough to actually house that eyeball. Nazardin found an eyeball from some animal in the universe and made it huge now a question to that is well if Nazardin can make the eye as big as it wants because Nazardin can it can make it larger than a uh, it can make it larger than a planet larger than a star it can make it as large as it wants to an extent um, can it shrink the eyeball well yes it can and it's not just that Nazardin can do that. Um, this species in which Nazardin comes from can do that. And so think of it as Nazardin as being the god of that species and looking out for that species. Those other versions of Nazardin that were in the smaller eyeballs, they can enlarge the eyeball and shrink it too. However, they... Uh, <clears throat> they can't go to the length Nazardin can. Nazardin is a cosmic god, so its limits is pretty much the physics of the universe. And so if it kept expanding the eyeball to get bigger and bigger, eventually gravity would take over and the eyeball would collapse in on itself. The science behind that, I don't know. Um, maybe somebody can figure it out, but Nazardin can enlarge the eyeball up to the limits of uh, physics. As for the Nazardin species, they come from a parallel, I don't even know how to describe it, but they come from a parallel universe where they just observe. And so that's why they take eyeballs, but they're also considered parasites. And so I have this name sheet where um, Naz is the first part of the name. The second part of the name for Re means gluttonous, and then parasite means din. So think of it as Naz the gluttonous parasite, and that's what it's translated to. But its name is Nazridin. So what these cosmic entities do is Nazardin goes from planet to planet and it eats the iron core and once it's ate the iron core it has enough I guess you could say energy or whatever to feed its kind 
and it needs iron cores from planets in order to survive. And so Nazardin, since it's a cosmic god, it's always getting pissed off because even though we can't see the parallel universes, those cosmic gods, they can, and they see them all the time. And so from Nazardin's perspective, when Nazardin came and wiped out that planet, it was, for Nazardin, it was pretty much like, oh, geez, another one. You know, I'll have to deal with another planet in five minutes because the eyeballs, they go wherever they want to and they just want to observe and obviously when they show up places sometimes they get attacked sometimes they don't if the eyeballs are left alone Nazardin will leave the planet alone and so it's pretty much like if you let the Nazardin things come and observe your planet eventually they're going to leave and go away they'll get bored they'll move on to something else and if you leave them alone, then Nazardin isn't going to come. But if you start hurting its kind, then it's just going to eat your planet for lunch. But as for Nazardin and all of that, that's... As of right now, that's pretty much the rules of the Cosmic God. If anybody wants to use it, go right on ahead. Just give me a shout out, please. Because I want to hear about these stories, you know. Um... Let's talk about Will um, not William. I was thinking of the Church of Sin. Let's talk about Charles and Lauren. I wanted to create a story where um, father and daughter are trying to reconnect, but I don't think I established enough of uh, Charles's Charles's drunken history. And so I feel like in the story, that was something that was lacking a little bit. You could understand that. You could understand that he got into a car accident and his wife died, and his two other daughters. But um, <clears throat> there really isn't anything showing uh, the struggles between Charles and Lauren, and so. If I were to ever expand this into a book, there would be a lot of time shared on those two and their conflict and their fighting and his alcoholism and how his alcoholism impacted his relationship with his daughter and him being able to parent properly. So that's the kind of um, relationship I wanted to capture. Now I wanted to go and talk about each lost tape. So let me pull that up on my computer. <clears throat> so the thing is with lost tapes, I'm trying to build anticipation toward what the main, the large video is going to be. And so when I write the stories, I write them in, I guess you could call it an order, but it's really not an order because each story they kind of feed off of each other, but at the same time, they really don't. They're their own standalone story. But for the sake of what I'm trying to accomplish here, the first story I wrote was David Patel's story. He was the guy who was responsible for making the little adjustments which brought the Nazruddin folk into their universe. And in this story, I don't know why, but I like David Patel the most. And I think that's because in the narrative of his story, he's got a troubled history and he didn't want a family because he was abused as a kid and he didn't want any of that. And that's unfortunate now because I've already written, recorded and put the stories up there. But uh, the other five astrophysicists weren't developed out as, as well. And so uh, let's move on to next, the next one, which would be Emery Bates. I get Emery Bates and another story mixed up because it's either um, one of them goes to a parallel dimension and they lost a child or they gained a child. I can't. I get the two confused. But with Emery Bates, 
he crosses into a parallel universe and I was trying to capture that when he goes into that universe he uh, he finds out his son is alive and in his home universe his son had died and I wish I would have spent more time going into that backstory but the goal is for these stories to only be 2,000 words because then that will equate to about a 13-15 minute video and I can manage to do a couple of those a week but with Emery Bates I wanted to capture the essence of that you know you cross into a parallel universe where you're filling the shoes of somebody who died but at the same time you're coming from a universe where your kid died and so it's this weird um, trade-off I guess you could say <laughs> but with Emery Bates that's pretty much what I was trying to achieve so let's move on to Ethan Ramirez <clears throat> so Ethan Ramirez this is the guy I believe I get him confused with him and Emery Bates so with Ethan Ramirez he crosses into the parallel universe and then he actually finds out his daughter is missing in this universe and so he goes all over the place trying to find her and he ends up going through a portal to hopefully return to his uh, home universe and so I wanted to capture that uh, next would be Marcus Taylor <clears throat> Marcus Taylor was more about going into the realm of where the Nazardin people come from and I don't know why I chose lavender but I just chose lavender fields and it worked and it made some really cool pictures but for the record Nazardin's not a purple eyeball or a blue eyeball. I couldn't get a stable diffusion to make a regular eyeball. Um, the eyes that are appearing in this universe, they're just eyes that are blinking open. Regular eyes. But when I saw what they look like in these pictures, I... I think it would be I think it would be entirely cool if the eyes could take on different colors not so much different shapes but there can be blue eyes purple eyes there's no red eyes in the story or nothing like that but um, the eyes could be different colors so I think that would be a really cool thing that I never even really thought of <clears throat> but as for Marcus he ventures into the realm of Nazardin and he's the first to actually see uh, that there's something inside of the pupil of these eyeballs and so that I wanted to capture that and I think I did that pretty well Olivia Grace so this is the fifth one I wrote and this is the one where uh, she's more embattled with the shadow government because the shadow government at this time in the story is trying to get her to go back to her home universe because they think that if you go back if you go through these portals that the eyeballs are creating you'll go back to your home universe but you actually don't you just go to a random a random universe and you switch places with whoever is in your spot in that universe and so imagine there's another version of you and universe 12 and you're here in universe 1 if you go to universe 12 you switch spots with the person who exists in universe 12 and so you go to 12 he come or she comes to universe 1 so you switch <clears throat> and that's how that works um, I really liked how that worked out but I wasn't sure if including um, Maggie worked or not it was more of an experiment but um, you know we'll, we'll, we'll see uh, the last one was Sophia meets so so Sophia meets was meant to be the bridge story bridging uh, lost tapes with the main story of Nazardin and so in this story 
Uh, people have started to become really comfortable with the eyes. They've learned that the eyes are not going to hurt them. And since the eyes aren't going to hurt them, people get stupid. At first, they start pushing the eyeballs around, maybe punching, kicking the eyeballs, hitting it with a baseball bat. For some reason, the eyeballs don't show up on camera for them. Um, the real reason is because these Nazardin creatures, they exist in a universe that we perceive, but it can't be picked up by electronics and so that's all it is it's because they're visiting the universe they're actually not in it they're just visiting it in a weird kind of way kind of like when you play a video game you're playing the video game but you're not actually in the video game and so when they kill the eyes then the eyes become 100 percent immersed in the universe that they were killed in and then that's why they're visible now on camera and so people they figure out oh well if we kill them we can take pictures of them and so this causes people to go out and kill them and some eyes they blink back to their home realm where Nazardin is at and then Obviously, Nazar didn't can tell, you know, hey, where are you guys going? Okay, I see what's wrong with you guys. And this is the first one where you see, you don't see, but it's implied that Nazar didn't killed one of those cobalt wolves. And the reason those cobalt wolves exist is because they eat Nazar that, That's all it is. They eat Nazar They come from their own realm, but with regards to humans, they're just they're harmless they're not going to do anything they're hunting the eyeballs wherever the eyes go those cobalt creatures go regardless but as for the lost tapes uh i had a lot of fun writing all of them and i hope you enjoyed taking in you know this universe and if you could do me do me a, a solid share this with one person you think would enjoy the story you know, mention the Lost Tapes, and if you haven't listened to the Lost Tapes yet, I'll have a playlist at the end of the video that you can click on and you can check it out. But, um, since this is going up in June, I wanted to make it clear that since summer's going to be here, kids can be out of school, all that stuff, I'm not going to have the time to work on a big project. So I will do smaller Lost Tapes, which will be similar to the two I uploaded at the beginning of uh, May. The Vampire Story and the, uh, the other story. The Ghost Story, the Ghost in the Wall Story. Um, so yeah, again, thank you for hanging around, watching the video, and uh, that's the origin of Nazardin. I hope you liked it and I also wanted to give a plug for myself on my Patreon. All the pictures in, that I use in the videos they're uploaded onto my Patreon and Nazardin I believe has over 500 pictures and the pictures are 1080p so they could be desktop wallpapers. Since they were made with AI I, I can't really claim ownership of them so if somebody wants to take them and use them in other videos or whatever that's cool you can go ahead and uh, or if you just want to download them put them on your desktop or share them that's cool you can go ahead and do that but um, I offer 25 free pictures but to get access to the full 500 it's like I don't know what it is but it's you know I'm asking for <laughs> support and trying to offer you know something for you and also on my patreon i have downloadable files of all of my stories so you can download the mp3s of these stories put them on your phone and you can listen to them without the internet and i know youtube runs ads and at some point i'll run ads when i can get to it but um yeah you can download all that stuff off of my patreon and you know it's a lot of cool stuff going on over there 
so if you have the time go ahead and check it out but again thank you for watching my story and enjoying it and i hope you share it with just one person peace out